chapter 40, care of patients with problems of the central nervous system, the spinal cord. Chapter begins on 872. We are going to begin with multiple sclerosis or MS beginning on page 872. We'll do a pathophysiology review and discuss the types. This is a progressive autoimmune disease, a chronic disorder of the central nervous system where the myelin and nerve axons in the brain and spinal cord are destroyed. Really an unknown etiology. There is consideration for possible genetic factors playing a role in the disease development. Having a first degree relative increases a person's risk for developing MS. There may be a viral contribution such as those associated in childhood. The life expectancy um, can be normal in this population with intermittent flare-ups depending on the type and we'll talk through those. The body here is attacking the myelin sheath and nerve fibers in the brain and spinal cord. This is leaving microscopic lesions that's making it difficult for nerve impulses to be processed or communicated properly. The first type we'll discuss is relapsing and remitting. This is the most common. Um, new symptoms develop and resolve, and then patient returns to baseline. This can progress to secondary progressive. And secondary progressive, um, again, that will begin with the relapsing and re remitting and then pros progress further. With the primary progressive, there's gradual steady deterioration with no remission um, and no acute attacks. And then there's progressive relapsing. Um, thank goodness this tends to be the least common. It has frequent relapses with partial recovery, um, but with no return to baseline. You want to look at the key features box on 873. Um, reviewing here, um, your patient may experience muscle weakness, fatigue, um, intentional tremors, flexor muscle spasms, numbness or tingling sensations, ataxia, um, dysphagia, nystagmus, um, decreased vision and hearing, and then tendonitis, bowel and bladder dysfunction, alternations in sexual performance, cognitive changes such as memory loss, impaired judgment, and decreased ability to solve problems or perform calculations, and depression. As we just discussed, changes in immunity tend to be the most likely etiology for MS, but the environment may also contribute to its development. For example, the disease is more often seen in colder climates of the Northeast, Great Lakes, and Pacific Northwest states, and also in Canada. I encourage you to review the key features box again on 873. These signs and symptoms are provoked by the body's attack on the myelin sheath and nerve fibers in the brain and spinal cord leaving behind microscopic lesions which impair nerve impulses. Depending on the location of these microscopic lesions and the age of your patient, the severity and type of symptoms your MS patient presents with may vary. In general, fatigue is common associated with constant sensitivity to temperature. Dysarthria is also common with slurred speech, nystagmus, that rapid or jerking involuntary movement of the eye. Dysmetria is the inability to control the distance, speed, and range of motion necessary to perform smoothly um, coordinated movements. Dysphagia, as we know, difficulty swallowing, and also bowel and bladder dysfunction. You always want to check again for mental and cognitive changes, performing an um, ac accurate screening for depression, um, and assessing their coping strategies. Reviewing laboratory and diagnostic assessments of your patient with MS. There is no definite labs or diagnostics to diagnose MS. Your patient may have a lumbar puncture for cerebral spinal fluid with analysis of this showing increased protein and white blood cell presentation. You may also have electrophoresis of your CSF fluid which would show increased myelin-based protein and IgG um, termed immunoglobulin G. An MRI may be performed that review, reveals the plaques, um, documents disease activity, and also can be used as an evaluation for treatment effectiveness. Now we will discuss the priority of hypothesis in nursing care for your patient with MS. 
their impaired immunity due to the disease and drug therapy for disease management, which we'll talk about next, decreased their impaired mobility due to muscle spasticity, intentional tremors and or fatigue, and then decreased vision acuity and cognition due to dysfunction of brain neurons. Again, there's um, no cure for MS, focuses on relieving symptoms and delaying progression of disease. Now we will discuss managing impaired immunity um, with medication management of your patient with MS. You do need to look at the medications as we discussed them on 875. The first one we're going to discuss is fingolimod. It was the first immune modulator approved for MS that can be taken with or without food. It's important that patients monitor their pulse because the side effect is bradycardia. Also, additional important side effects are GI disturbances and facial flushing. The goal of these medications are to um, modify the course of the disease, and it also has antiviral effects. Now, with other drugs like interferon, they may develop flu-like symptoms as it's reviewed in the drug alert box on 875. With glutiramide acetate, they may, so may also have increased likelihood um, to have an infection. So instruct patients about flu-like reactions that are very common. For patients receiving any of the interferons, and these symptoms can be minimized by starting at a low dose and giving acet acetaminophen or ibuprofen. Um, teaching patients receiving them to avoid crowds and people with infections because these drugs can cause bone marrow suppression. Remind them to report any signs or symptoms associated with infection immediately to their primary care provider. Usually the first dose of these medications is given under medical supervision to monitor for allergic reaction, including anaphylactic shock. Looking on page 876 for management of muscle spasticity, which can be contributing to your patient's pain, the primary care provider may prescribe baclofen or tizanidine. Other medication therapies may also be stool softeners or oxybutyn. The priority, again, for these patients is to prevent those secondary infections that can come from decreased um, immune systems, with including drugs like immune modulators that we discussed and anti-inflammatory meds, making sure you're providing that education on um, avoidance of large crowds. Usually the steroids are utilized for acute flare-ups. They may receive um, solumedrol to reduce inflammation and edema. Then the patient may be started on oral prednisone, 60 milligrams PO, for five to seven days. Additional members of your care team will likely be PT, OT, and speech and language pathologist, as well as home health and case management. Your patient will often be um, weak and fatigued, so making sure you're allowing adequate rest um, to complete activities and balance exercise and exertion with appropriate rest periods. We will review some of the complementary and integrative health therapies that are listed on 876. Um, it has been beneficially shown that yoga, massage, and acupuncture are helpful. Focusing on education, making um, your patient and caregivers aware of triggers to avoid, including stress, sickness, smoke, smoking, and then sun and heat, um, meaning overexertion and balancing that exercise exertion with appropriate rest. Neurosurgery is an option. It is typically a last resort due to risk. Um, indicated usually for release of tremors, a thalamotomy. This is a surgical procedure to treat tremors and involves destroying part of the thalamus. And that's an area, as we know, the brain that can be damaged with MS and contribute to tremor formation. This surgery, again, is usually only to be considered if it's a very severe tremor that has not responded to other treatment. There is also deep brain stimulation therapy that involves implanting electrodes in the brain and then um, the pulse generator just under the collarbone. That deep brain stimulator system operates much the same way as the, as the pacemaker that we've previously discussed, um, meaning pacemaker of the brain versus the heart. Next, we're going to talk about spinal cord injury beginning on 877 of your text. This can be a complete or incomplete injury. Complete meaning all function eliminated below the level of injury. And incomplete being the more common of the two will allow for some function below the level of injury. We know there's um, five primary um, causes for a spinal cord injury. 
Um, the first one being hyperflexion. This usually occurs in motor vehicle accidents with a forceful um, forward acceleration and extreme neck flexion. There's also hyperextension, also related typically to a motor vehicle accident with being struck from behind or a fall. There's this acceleration and deceleration motion. Next is axle loading or vertical compression. This usually um, occurs from diving accidents, so diving head first into a shallow area or falls. Imagine someone falling um, straight onto their feet. There's excessive um, rotation injuries, which causing head to turn beyond the normal range, and then penetrating traumas like knives or, or um, bullet wounds. So when thinking about the mechanism of action, we're thinking about usually a sports injury, motor vehicle accident, slip and falls, or violence. Figure 40.2 on page 878, demonstrating that hyperflexion injury occurring when the head is suddenly and forcefully accelerated forward, causing extreme flexion of the neck. Um, again, typically seen in head-on collisions or diving accidents. The flexion injury to the lower thoracic and lumbar spine may occur when your trunk is suddenly flexed on itself, and this can occur when you have a fall and you're landing on your buttocks. And then the posterior ligaments can also be stretched or torn. Vertebrae can also be fractured, dislocated. Either of these processes may disrupt the integrity of the spinal cord, causing hemorrhage, edema, and necrosis, which is some additional secondary um, injuries or complications of a spinal cord injury. Figure 40.3 on page 878, this is demonstrating hyperextension injuries, which occur most often in automobile, automobile accidents in which the client's vehicle is struck from behind or during a fall when that client's chin is, chin is tucked. Um, the head is suddenly accelerated and then decelerated. This stretches or tears the anterior ligament fractures or subluxes the vertebrae and can even rupture um, inter intervertebral disc. As with flexion injuries, the spinal cord um, may be um, easily damaged. And then on page um, 878 at 40.4, this is demonstration of an axle loading injury. It's an injury such again as diving into the water um, head first, hitting the bottom or land um, on your feet um, really hard. That axle loading injury, more common in diving accidents, falls on the buttocks or a jump. The blow to the top of the head um, from these injuries causes the vertebrae to shatter with pieces of the bone um, within the spinal canal and then damaging your spinal cord. We've talked about the primary etiology for spinal cord injury, that being trauma, falls, acts of violence, or sports, recreational related activities. We're going to talk about some secondary injuries due to spinal cord injuries listed as bullet points on page 878, including hemorrhage, ischemia, hypovolemia, and local edema. Local edema is due to primary and secondary injuries contributing to capillary compression and cord ischemia. Now, neurogenic shock, I mean, we talked about this form of distributive shock in 1940. It's going to impair tissue perfusion. It differs from hypovolemic shock where there's loss of volume. We do not have loss of vo volume in neurologic shock. Um, now, spinal shock, this is a different form that's going to usually occur immediately after the spinal cord injury. It's going to result in temporary loss of motor, sensory, and reflex functions below one's level of injury. It's caused by inflammation and swelling of the spinal cord, which is going to restrict blood flow below that level of injury. Now, once the spinal cord is stabilized, this swelling slows down, individuals may gradually recover, and reflexes return. Let's go back and talk some more about neurogenic shock. What's going on here? It's a condition in which you have trouble keeping your heart rate, blood pressure, and temp stable. This is because blood um, vessels stop working properly. They're not pushing enough blood through the body due to vasodilation. You do not experience blood loss, but blood is not um, circulating correctly, and blood's pulling in vessels, so therefore you're going to experience um, bradycardia and hypotension. Your patient may also have flushed skin. This is due to that blood pooling. It's warm and dry due to blood volume under the skin. This is a disruption of the sympathetic nervous system. 
with preserved parasympathetic activity. So this is going to affect coronary blood flow, cardiac contractility, and heart rate. This is most common in those with um, spinal cord injury at T6 or higher because this is where the sympathetic nervous system inverts here at the heart from T1 to T5. We'll talk about management of this a little bit later in, in the recording and in lecture, but it's going to compose of usually IV fluids, vasopressors, and atropine. Now, hypovolemic shock or, um, can result usually from hemorrhaging with a spinal cord injury. With this presentation, your patient would have tachycardia due to the hemorrhage into that spinal cord or systemic hemorrhaging that's going to decrease perfusion to the spinal cord. Chronic complications outside of these um, for your patient with spinal cord injury do, does include decreased life expectancy. This is due to immobility complications such as pneumonia and sepsemia. Now we're going to talk about recognizing cues in a spinal cord injury. With history taking, important to de determine how the injury occurred, the mechanism of injury, and any pre-hospital care. We'll talk about physical assessment, signs and symptoms, and prioritization of care management, which is going to be around your ABCs. Also, the importance of continued sensory perception and mobility assessment to determine if there's any worsening of status of your patient and not forgetting your psychosocial assessment. So inquiring about the history of the injury, make sure you're asking about location, position um, of the injury, symptoms, immunization devices used like a C collar or black backboard, um, any pre-hospitalization treatment and meds, um, previous medical surgical history and current medications. Let's talk about what to expect um, possibly with your patient based on the level of injury. So with a cervical injury, this is most severe. Can be life-threatening if breathing is impaired. This is typically going to cause paralysis below the neck or the level of injury re resulting in quadriplegia. Now your thoracic injury is going to affect the trunk of the body, usually resulting in paraplegia. A lumbar injury is total or partial loss of bowel and bladder function. Um, so with lumbar, with lumbar starting with L, think legs and leaky bladder. Now when the spinal cord is injured, there may be permanent or temporary loss of sensation and activity below the level of injury. Usually one to, do, one to two days following the injury, nerve cells become less responsive to sensory input, result, resulting in full or partial loss of spinal cord reflexes. And then one to three days following, there's initial return of some reflexes. And then one to four weeks later, there's this hyperreflexia, a pattern of unusually strong reflexes are occurring. And one to 12 months after, Maybe that hyperreflexia is continuing. Your patient may have the spasticity, what we already talked about, the baclofen or the tenazidine being used to help with these symptoms and pain. This progress um, process is due to the changes in the neural cell bodies um, and can take much longer um, to present compared to the other stages. Now, your psychological assessment, that's um, discussions beginning on page 880 of your text. Um, people with spinal cord injuries are going to react in different ways. It's important that you um, assess their reaction, the reaction of their um, family caregivers or significant others. Very important that you're realistic with them about their hopes and expectations of what um, returning to normal is considered. Rehab, rehab can help them regain function. Um, if this is possible, it can assist them to be productive and enjoy their lives, even though there's now been a significant change. Patients experiencing a spinal cord injury may have significant behavior and emotional reactions as a result of their changes in functional ability, body image, role performance, and self-concepts. Um, they provide opportunities to listen to their concerns, again, offering hope and encouragement while remaining realistic. Now let's talk about some laboratory and imaging assessments that may be ordered or performed in your patient with a spinal cord injury. Um, usually a spinal CT and MR are performed to determine the degree um, or extent of the injury. This is beginning on page 881 of your text. Analyzing cues and prioritizing hypothesis. 
There's potential for respiratory distress and failure due to aspiration, decreased diaphragm, um, and or decreased mobility, potential for cardiovascular instability, shock, and autonomic dyslexia, which we'll talk about right at the end of this um, lecture. This is due to the loss or interruption of the sympathetic um, nervous system or hemorrhaging. There's potential for secondary spinal cord injuries due to hypofusion, edema, or delayed spinal cord stabilization, as we kind of talked about already with the secondary injuries, decreased mobility and sensory perception due to spinal cord damage and edema. Now we're going to begin on page 881 discussing generation of solutions and taking action. Your priority remains ABCs and C-spine precautions. Maintaining airway and oxygenation and C-spine precautions is the number one safety consideration. We want to do an initial exam and this is usually performed from across the room as we're entering the room. We're asking ourselves, are they breathing on their own? Um, how is their breathing rate? Do they have appropriate color in their face extremities? Is there any evidence of external um, bleeding? Is the patient in a C collar or on a backboard? Um, figure 40.6 um, on page 883 shows um, what a C collar looks like. You always want to assess for impairment and skin integrity around the corn around the collar. If um, the patient was need needed some rescue breathing. The best maneuver for opening the airway is a jaw thrust maneuver compared to a head tilt remover to prevent any additional injury to the spinal cord. Now talking about cardiovascular, um, when we talk about systolic blood pressure, I know or there should be a pressure in your mind of what, when we get concerned and this is a systolic blood pressure less than 90 because we know less than 90 is going to impair perfusion. Um, to our spinal cord, so very concerning if systolic blood pressure is less than 90. Now, part of your sensory assessment, this is about that detailed assessment of mobility and sensory perception. This helps determine the level of injury. It's also a baseline that you can utilize going forward on future assessments um, as far as any worsening or improvements and examining of deep tendon reflexes. That's usually done by um, a provider. We've already talked about neurogenic shock. This usually occurs again within the first 24 hours of the spinal cord injury. It is a medical emergency. You need to um, be familiar with and review the critical rescue box on page 882. You must notify your MD immediately. Usually IV fluids or dextran, which is a plasma expander. Um, this is going to help improve BP and perfusion. May utilize atropine if the heart rate is less than 50 beats per minute and a vasoactive um, medication like dopamine. Now patients with your spinal cord injuries um, at T6 or above are at greater risk for respiratory distress. So managing secretions with coughing assisting that's demonstrated in figure 40.5. Also focusing on pulmonary hygiene um, and suctioning. Next, we're going to talk about surgery management. This begins on page 884 of your text. Um, surgical management is prioritized within the first 24 hours to reduce the risk of some of those secondary complications that we discussed. Typically, will include um, wiring and spinal fusion for cervical injuries and the insertion of steel or metal rods for stabilization. We'll talk about the halo vest um, to immobilize the cervical spine. Now, thoracic and lumbar fusions, there's usually metal or steel rods to keep the bone ends aligned after refraction reduction. The patient may wear a molded plastic support de device for immobilization. When talking about the halo device, it's important um, that you refer to page 883. Um, this is the patient and family education box as well as the action alert box there. You never want to move or turn the patient by holding on um, to that halo device. Um, you do not want to adjust the screws holding it in place. You want to check the skin frequently to ensure that jacket is not causing breakdown and that you're able to insert one finger um, into that vest, monitoring pin sites for signs and symptoms of infection and notifying immediately if these do occur. Talking a little bit more here about the halo device, you can see 
um, an image of this in figure 40.7 on page 883 of your text just below the C, the C collar image. This is a mobilization of the surgical spine. Um, it's a fixed skeletal traction, usually consists of four pins screwed into the skull, and then it's connected to a vester jacket, and it's worn for six to 12 weeks. You can see why pin care here is so important. Again, I encourage you to review that action alert box there on 883 and the use of the halo fixator with vest. Also talking about some self-management education for your patient with um, mobility skills and pressure ulcer um, or injury prevention. This is discussed on page 884 with decreased mobility. Um, your patient's at risk for pressure injuries, DVTs, contractures, fractures related to osteoporosis. Let's look over on page 885. And you'll see here the care of the patient with spinal cord injury. So typically in collaboration with a rehabilitation team, you're gonna teach or reinforce um, teachings for bed mobility skills and bed to chair transfers. Patients with paraplegia are usually able to transfer from bed to chair or wheelchair with minimal or no assistance unless balance is a problem. Um, techniques to improve balance are usually taught by occupational therapists. Tetraplegic patients may learn how to transfer using a slider, also called a sliding board. The simple board-like device allows the patient to move from bed to chair or vice versa by creating a bridge. When using the slider, reminding patients to lift their buttocks when moving um, across the board. Now, your patients with severe muscle spasticity, they may have more challenge when learning these transfer skills and also with contractures. Now, contractures may be um, prevented or minimized with splints and range of motion exercises, so making sure you have involvement of your physical therapist and your occupational um, therapist for scheduling of placement and removing splints. Now, according to the Interprof Interprofessional Education Collaborative Expert Panel um, Competency of Interprofessional Communication, um, being sure to use the language that's easily understood by the patient when coordinating care. I think that goes without being said. We talk that um, with all of our patients, that it's not only the education that we're delivering, but we're making sure we're delivering it in terms that they can understand. Your patient is also at risk for orthostatic hypotension. This is common in those with um, a cervical spinal cord injury. This is due to interrupted sympathetic um, nervous system that's caused by the spinal cord injury. The blood vessels do not constrict quick enough, so there's not enough um, blood that's being pushed to the brain. That's going to lead to dizziness and lightheadedness, making your patient and family member aware of this and knowing that it's important to make those position changes slowly. Now, bowel and bladder retraining, this is really going to be needed for all your patients with a spinal cord injury. Um, adequate fluid, stool softeners, maybe an intermittent urinary um, cath, applying some manual pressure to the, to the bladder, um, bowel dis disimpactment, um, really rectal stimulation. This is only done with an order because it could cause vagal stimulus, which would cause your patient to have severe bradycardia and even have a syncopal event. If your patient has a lower um, spinal cord injury, Remember, we want to um, expect that they will present with paraplegia and that flaccid um, bowel. Now, most hospitals, talk, beginning on 866, is going to talk about the discussion of sexuality with your patient. This is done a lot in rehab programs versus the inpatient setting. Um, so again, reason to reinforce the importance of rehab and therapy afterwards. Um, men with injuries above T6 are often able um, to have erections by stimulation reflex activity. Um, now the ejaculation may be mixed with urine. Um, however, urine is sterile. So this is a good educational point for your patient and your partner as far as what to expect here and that um, will the, the patient's partner will not get an infection because that urine is sterile. I saved um, the discussion of autonomic dysreflexia for 
the end of this recording and lecture just because it requires some discussion of how to recognize it, um, how to treat it, how to intervene immediately due to its um, life risking complication. We'll flip through a few different sections and pages of the book to wrap this all together, so just be prepared um, to do that as we talk here. This mainly occurs for patients with a spinal cord um, injury at T6 or higher. The discussion of this is going to begin on page 880. Um, it is when critical nerve signals are prevented from reaching the brain due to that injury at T6 or higher. Um, the blood vessels below that level of injury tighten up, making it harder for blood to travel through, and that's going to lead to some of these dangerous symptoms we're going to talk about. So typically signs and symptoms um, include elevated blood pressure. This is going to be systolic and diastolic with the presentation of bradycardia. They'll typically have sweating and flushed face, blurred vision, and a headache that's severe and throbbing. You want to be familiar with the key features box on page 880. Also talking about treatment, as this is a preventable um, condition, and we'll talk a little bit about that later, as this is mainly caused by bladder distension, a UTI, um, bowel distension, impaction from constipation, um, or the irritation of hemorrhoids. Also pain or tight clothing and temperature fluctuations. And those um, potential causes are listed on page 880 of your text. Now treatment's going to begin on page 882. This is to sit up or raise the head of your client's bed to 90 degrees. This is the first action um, and also involvement of notifying your rapid response team. This is reviewed in the critical rescue box on page 882. You want to check um, and empty their bowel bladder, palpate for bladder distension, and loosen any restrictive or tight clothing. Monitoring blood pressure closely again for this severe hypertension that can occur. You want to review the emergency care box on 882. When looking at this, you'll see again it touches on placing the patient in that sitting position, assessing for any causes as we just reviewed them, um, determining if a UTI or bladder bladder stone is contributing, checking for fecal impaction or colorectal irritation, examining skin for new or worsening pressure injuries, monitoring that blood pressure closely with to here every 10 to 15 minutes, and then likely intervening with some type um, of antihypertensive like nifedipine or a nitrite as prescribed to lower that blood pressure as needed. That's why it's important to make this position change, raise that head of bed to reduce um, blood pressure as first action and then notifying your rapid response team or healthcare provider immediately for drug therapy as, as discussed in that critical rescue box on 882.